Hello, everyone. Um, hi, my name is Julia Sizek, and I am a postdoc here at Social Science Matrix, and I am here to welcome you to our exciting book panel here today. Um, today, we're going to be discussing Rebecca Herman's new book, Cooperating with the Colossus, which is an examination of U.S. military bases built in Latin America during World War II. She examines the tensions of United States empire and the project of cooperating for hemispheric defense. And she does this not only through looking at diplomatic projects, but through conflicts over discrimination, labor rights, and criminal jurisdiction on the ground. Today's event is part of our Author Meets Critics series, which features critically engaged discussions about recent books by faculty and alumni in the UC Berkeley's Social Sciences Division. We would like to thank UC Berkeley's Department of History for co-sponsoring this event. I will be introducing our moderator, um, Elena Schneider. Elena Schneider is a historian of Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic world, and an associate professor in the UC Berkeley History Department. Her research focuses on Cuba and the Caribbean, comparative colonialism and slavery, and the Black Atlantic. Methodologically, she seeks to write history that moves across regional, imperial, and national boundaries, integrating diverse stories that are normally told separately. She is also committed to the practice of writing history from below and challenging archival work that makes reconstructing the experiences of historically marginalized peoples possible. Her book, The Occupation of Havana, is a long durée history of the causes, central dynamics, and enduring consequences of a crucial incident of imperial warfare, the British invasion, occupation, and return to Havana during the final stages of the Seven Years' War. Sure. Thank you, Julia. We're going to do a little AB while I stand up. Um, hi. Thanks so much for coming to those of you who are here in person. And thank you also to those, to those of us who are here on Zoom. We really appreciate you all joining us today. This is a real pleasure, a chance to talk about uh, my colleague, um, Rebecca Herman's book. Um, so I'm, a, as was mentioned, I'm an associate professor in the history department working in the Latin American Caribbean field along with um, Rebecca Herman. Um, and so uh, my job is just to introduce our panelists um, individually. And then I'll be sort of moderating and fielding questions. Uh, we also have a microphone and Julia will circulate uh, to gather your questions during the Q&A period. We'll also be fielding questions from Zoom. Uh, so Rebecca Herman is an assistant professor in UC Berkeley's Department of History. Her work explores 20th century Latin American social and political history in a global context, probing the intersections between grand narratives and local history. Her book, Cooperating with the Colossus, reconstructs a contentious U.S. military basing project advancing Latin America during World War II under the banner of inter-American cooperation and hemispheric defense. And also, would you like to say a word? Maybe mention your next project when you get a chance. Okay. Um, your bio is too short. <laughs> uh, our next panelist, critic number one, uh, is, is Julio Morena. He is a professor of history at the University of San Francisco. He is the author of Yankee Don't Go Home, Mexican Nationalism, American Business Culture, and the Shaping of Modern Mexico from 1920 to 1950. His other publications are on U.S.-Latin American relations during the Cold War. His research and publications center on the intersection of U.S. business and diplomacy through the subfields of diplomatic business and cultural history. He is currently writing a book on the history of Coca-Cola in Latin America. Okay, so thank you. I'll turn the um, microphone over first to Rebecca. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And Julia, thanks so much for all of your work organizing this. Uh, Chuck, for the technical support and my critics, my wonderful critics, thank you for joining. We'll see if I'm still smiling at the end of the session. <laughs> um, so I think my role on the panel is really just to sort of orient those of you, uh, probably the majority of you have not read this book. And so I want to help to contextualize it a little bit so that the, um, the comments from Jose Juan and Julio uh, do make sense and uh, tell you a little bit about it. And then um, I'm gonna turn the mic over so we can hear some of the comments and questions um, from our guests. Um, so you may not have read the book, but you've read the title, which really gives a lot away. <laughs> Uh, it's a book about U.S. military bases in World War II Latin America. 
uh, though it focuses most heavily and is really anchored in the experiences of communities in three countries, Brazil, Cuba, and Panama. And I can talk more about that uh, during the Q&A if, if you want to sort of geek out around methodology and, and that sort of thing. But I wanted to mention that now in case that, that proves relevant in, in the comments. Um, and the book examines both the high politics of basing uh, and also the social histories of the bases themselves. So it moves between different registers. It moves between the international, national, and local spheres in which this history of wartime basing unfolded. Um, through the history of these bases, it tries to contemplate the nature of cooperation between unequal partners. So for those of you who aren't that familiar with the region's history, Colossus of the North is a nickname that the United States has had in Latin America that really speaks to the kind of uh, preponderance of U.S. power and the U.S. tendency towards interventionism in the region. So cooperating with the Colossus is intended to, to highlight the fact that this book is really thinking about how folks in Latin America have tried to engage U.S. power um, uh, while grappling with the consequences of these asymmetries in their relationships. Um, because of the overwhelming history of U.S. interventionism in the region, cooperation is really not the first word that comes to mind when you think about the history of U.S. Latin American relations. Um, but I think that actually Latin Americans frustrated efforts to find ways to effectively cooperate with the Colossus has been a constant and really kind of under scrutinized through line in the history of the region. Um, and the scholarship on US Latin American relations in recent years has really moved in a direction that I think sets us up well to examine those efforts in a, in a nuanced and responsible way. Um, there's been a, a push in recent years led by Julio Moreno and others to take more seriously Latin American agency in histories of US Latin American relations um, without diminishing the asymmetries of power that structure relationships in the hemisphere. So that's a sort of balancing act that I try to engage in this book. Um, to give you some context about the bases and uh, explain how I use those bases as a vehicle for thinking about these broader themes. Um, Here's a map that uh, we had drawn up for the book. Um, during the Second World War, the US established over 200 defense sites on sovereign soil in Latin America. So they made me break it into two maps because I really wanted one map, but they said it was too cluttered. <laughs> when it's on a single book page, it just doesn't uh, uh, turn out to be very legible. Um, the US at this point already occupied the uh, naval base in Guantanamo Bay and uh, already had established the Panama Canal Zone, but most of the other defense sites on this map were new to the war period. And World War II was really a, a key moment in the growth of the United States global basing empire. So today it's sort of taken for granted that the United States has this global military footprint that's an important part of its national defense and, and, and thinking about national security. But before World War II, the US only had around 14 bases outside of US continental borders. Um, today that count is somewhere around 750. So over the intervening years, that number has expanded and contracted, but World War II was really an important moment in the sort of outward uh, push of US, US national defense. Um, what makes it interesting in terms of thinking about the history of these bases as they were created and, and how these stories played out on the ground is that there's really not much by way of precedent at this moment. So there's this real kind of make it up as you go along part of the story uh, that I found in the archives as I was trying to understand the history of these, of these places. Okay, so why did the United States want bases in Latin America during World War II? Because you don't think of Latin America typically when you think of uh, the Second World War, unless you're a Latin Americanist. <laughs> um, Elena, do you mind passing me with the water? Thanks so much. Okay, so... Um, well before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, there was an overwhelming concern among U.S. defense strategists that German forces could cross the South Atlantic from West Africa to the northeast of Brazil. So I put this sort of generic world map up here uh, so that you can just get a sense spatially of how close that uh, proximity really is. So it's only about 1,600 miles to cross the South Atlantic. 
Um, this is a moment when thinking about defense strategy is changing because of advances in aviation technology, right? So airplanes really shrink the distance between places and um, make US defense planners feel the nation is much more vulnerable uh, than it's ever been before. And so there was this scenario that was envisioned where German forces might cross the South Atlantic. There might be this fifth column of Nazi sympathizers already living throughout the region who would then receive them and help them in their pursuit either of an attack on the Panama Canal, which is a really important strategic asset for the US, or invade the United States. And so defense planners called for the development of strategic airfields at really close intervals, because right, aviation has advanced, but still not that far. Planes still can't fly that far. Um, so that means you need a lot of airfields. Um, and the objective was to be in a position to unilaterally defend the Americas from any kind of extra hemispheric aggression. Now, the usual uh, story about the US and Latin America in World War II is that it was this kind of atypical moment of harmony in the Americas, this real kind of high point. Um, this is a poster from the, the war period produced by a US government agency that was circulated throughout the region. It's the image that's on my book cover. I believe I have the Spanish version on the book cover. This one's in Portuguese. It was circulated throughout the region. Um, the first three decades of the 20th century had been a period marked by repeated US military intervention in, in the region. Um, and these military interventions had fomented all kinds of anti-US sentiment, um, it, well beyond the, the places in the Americas that experienced that intervention firsthand. And um, it, during the early 1930s, for reasons that maybe I can't fit into a 15 minute spiel, but the US government um, pulls back from that interventionist tendency and sort of reinvents US policy towards Latin America under the banner of the good neighbor policy. Uh, the name of the policy is sort of felt self-explanatory, but the, the basic premise is we're not gonna intervene in Latin American affairs anymore. Um, this was a, a development that Latin American jurists and diplomats had been seeking for decades through various uh, different strategies. And so when the United States finally conceded to a principle of non-intervention in the region, it was seen as this huge boost to inter-American affairs. And that boost and the goodwill that it generated became really important in the late 1930s. Because there was this concern about access sympathies in the Americas, there was a sense that uh, goodwill was now a national security imperative. Right, they needed to push back against the anti-US imperialism that had become really baked into nationalism in different parts of the region during this era. Um, so um, ultimately, this so um, this is all to contextualize why this sort of moment of Pan-American unity during World War II was seen as a departure. And ultimately, the American republics do band together in support of the Allied cause, even the holdouts that wait until later in the war end up breaking ties with the Axis powers. Uh, Brazil and Mexico both send uh, soldiers to fight in the war. Uh, many of the American republics that don't send soldiers do declare war. And so Pan-American unity in the war is often described as this sort of crowning achievement of the good neighbor policy. And uh, one that is sort of fatefully discarded when the Cold War uh, brings new security concerns to the United States and then the US returns to interventionism. So that's sort of the, the typical um, narrative. And so World War II, with the exception of some key aspects of that story, doesn't get tons and tons of attention in the literature on US Latin American relations, in part maybe because it's sort of atypical, right? In a broader story that's more organized around uh, intervention. But in my book, I suggest that we've erred in taking wartime cooperation at face value and also in dismissing post-war cooperation as a charade. And that we might instead think about cooperation critically as a vital and dynamic field of contest in the Americas. So I use basing to do that. And it, it works pretty well, in my opinion, because it was the most contentious form of cooperation, right? So there's this whole menu of ways that the American republics cooperate during the war. Hosting US bases is by far the most politically unpalatable. And so the way that I found when I got into the archives, 
folks in the diplomatic sphere trying to navigate this difficult proposition, and then people on the ground who encounter U.S. soldiers in their communities where U.S. bases are hosted, uh, presented a lot of opportunities for thinking about um, the, the inherent tensions between national sovereignty and international cooperation between unequal partners. Um, okay, so let me just tell you quickly about the book's structure. Um, it, I think I mentioned in the beginning that the book moves between scales. And this is in part because when I was in the archives and I was beginning to reconstruct these stories about the different spheres in which I saw conflicts over sovereignty playing out, it wasn't just in diplomatic negotiations over basic, it was also in navigating newly won labor rights on defense construction sites. It was in the nature of race relations in places where workforces were segregated. It was in how US base authorities uh, took it upon themselves to regulate prostitution in the communities surrounding basing, sometimes in violation of local law, uh, and in fights over criminal jurisdiction. Um, and this question of do Latin American authorities have retained the right to police the behavior of U.S. personnel on their own soil? And if not, is that an infringement on sovereignty that's unacceptable, that's at odds with the good neighbor policy? Um, so the chapters in the book take kind of an hourglass shape in terms of the scale that they're operating at. Um, I begin at the regional level uh, where I talk about the history of basing in the Americas and the problem of basing uh, from the perspective of its various constituents. Um, in chapter two, I move into the bilateral realm, consider how Latin American heads of state and their foreign ministers negotiated the terms of U.S. basing. Um, Typically, they managed those appeals for basing rights by leveraging them, uh, using them as bargaining chips to solicit all kinds of quid pro quo uh, economic and, and military aid that would help them to advance some of their own nation building objectives during this period. Um, Latin American leaders were especially reluctant to accept any terms around basing that would openly diminish their nation's territorial integrity or the principle of territorial sovereignty. So questions around jurisdiction were especially complicated. And remember, this is the beginning of the US basing, uh, establishing bases on sovereign peer nations, right? So previously the US had bases typically in colonial territories or places where the United States didn't profess to respect the territorial sovereignty of that place. So the, the, the fact of the good neighbor rhetoric surrounding territorial sovereignty created a host of issues around how do we actually operate these bases and who's in charge. Um, so what that meant in effect, particularly in the context of war, things are moving quickly. They're trying to advance this defense construction without creating all kinds of backlash. The terms around governance were usually really vague in formal agreements and were often worked out on the ground. So that's where the subsequent four chapters go. They go to the ground and they look at how these sort of ad hoc governance systems were improvised at different places and sort of built in the context uh, that would best uh, be most effective in, in each space. Um, for me, these middle chapters are really the heart of the book. Um, while US and Latin American leaders managed to strike mutually beneficial agreements in the high political realm, problems on the ground, noise from below really routinely threaten that peace. Um, I've already described some of those conflicts, right? U.S. defense contractors failing to observe newly won labor laws, uh, race and nation-based segregation at defense sites, uh, U.S. soldiers violating local social norms or upsetting existing social practices, particularly in their engagements with local women. Um, uh, U.S. base authorities regulating prostitution, and then police and courts lacking the authority to police the behavior of U.S. personnel. So sometimes these conflicts were settled locally, but often they required some kind of state intervention. A lot of times you see people on the ground appealing to their own national leaders or directly to Franklin Roosevelt saying, this is really at odds with the good neighbor policy and using that language of uh, the war um, to advocate uh, for the ends that they sought. Um, 
The various resolutions that U.S. and Latin American allies devised to resolve these conflicts uh, tell us something about a problematic relationship between international and domestic politics that cooperation wrought. And this consequence for domestic politics that these international relationships precipitates is something that I'm really interested in. Um, you start to see a little bit of a pattern emerge over these chapters. With labor law, prostitution policy, and criminal jurisdiction, you see Latin American leaders who profess a nationalist defense of territorial sovereignty uh, surrender jurisdiction in, in practice, even if they refuse to do it in principle. And so you see sort of um, typically covert means by which, for example, labor laws can be suspended or imperfectly applied in ways that benefit U.S. interests. So then finally in chapter seven, I zoom back out. I consider the fate of these wartime bases. Um, popular protests at the war's end ultimately forced the evacuation of most of them. Um, and I think a little bit about the legacy of wartime cooperation in the post-war era and moving uh, into the Cold War. Um, I had a few notes about how this fits in the scholarship, but I think I might be pushing it on time. So I might save that for our discussion. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so, um, all right. Well, maybe I'll just say just a few words about where this fits in the scholarship. So I think I hinted at this when I first began speaking. Um, but with this book, I'm really building on a broader intellectual project that's been underway uh, uh, for some time to restore Latin American agency to histories of U.S. Latin American relations, right, to push back against the idea that the United States is this sort of all-powerful puppet master in the region that's pulling the strings of dictators and the like, um, but doing so in a way that doesn't diminish the sort of really great power asymmetries that shape relations in the region. Um, this is manifested in the scholarship in a number of ways that I think really lend themselves to a more nuanced consideration of cooperation as an analytic theme in the region's past. Um, one trend has been scholarship that sort of recognizes Latin American dictators and other powerful elites as complex historical figures uh, with their own agendas um, and interests and motivations in enlisting US power. Uh, another has been to look at the work of Latin American diplomats and jurists and intellectuals as uh, architects of international governance. And then there's other scholarship that's more focused on social and cultural histories and tends to be grounded uh, uh, in more of a bottom-up framework. Um, uh, uh, folks who have found that close encounters is one of the um, phrases from a, a, a leading uh, book in this field. Uh, with U.S. power on the ground in Latin America to be an effective means for understanding the agency of less powerful people, right? So not just looking at diplomats and dictators, but also um, uh, folks who might disappear if you zoom out too much. Um, resistance remains a popular analytic theme in those ground level accounts, but even that portrait of resistance often includes the ingenuity of ordinary people uh, channeling foreign resources to advance their own ends. So. Um, you see both with elites or people on the high political stage and folks on the ground, these efforts to cooperate with the Colossus. So that's why I have that kind of hokey title, um, because this is something that I really am seeing in, in the work of others as well. Um, it, so in all of these distinct narratives, there's this common pattern, right? Latin American actors trying to make the most of a partnership with powerful and well-resourced counterparts from the United States while also confronting and trying to mitigate the inequality that structures their relationships. So in regards to how my project fits, how the Good Neighbor Era fits into this broader story, um, I uh, believe that rather than um, mark kind of a brief era book ended by periods of interventionism, World War II is better understood as an important pivot point in this longer story. Um, there's a certain political economy of security cooperation that's forged during the war that lives on as a really important legacy of the war in inter-American relations during the Cold War period and beyond. Uh, for U.S. officials, security cooperation remains a more discrete mode of intervention, um, one that's really born in this period that's conventionally known for its non-interventionism. 
Uh, so in other words, the book endeavors to rethink how the Good Neighbor era fits into the longer history of US Latin American relations, not merely by demonstrating as others have that the period itself was riddled with intervention after all, though it was, or that the US simply innovated new tools for sustaining hegemony during this period, though it did, but by taking a wider angle lens to the history of the region that views intervention as one feature of this broader dynamic contest over US power and resources in the Americas. Um, considering cooperation allows us to see how cooperation, which was envisioned by some in Latin America as this avenue for collapsing international hierarchy also helps in practice to preserve that hierarchy. All right, I'll stop there, thank you. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, thank you for the invitation. And it's truly an honor uh, to have the opportunity to comment on your book. I don't like to think of myself as a critic because I, I really, really enjoy reading the book. And it's one of those books, right, that you read, consciously read slowly, and you really don't want it to end, right? Because the way the different stories unfold throughout the book is just, just amazing, very engaging. Uh, so... I had a hard time thinking about what can I say, right, that would really kind of highlight uh, where the field is, right, how uh, Rebecca really contributes to that field, and what are some of the questions, some long-term questions that I think we should consider, right, as we look at this uh, type of accounts, right, that you provide for us. Uh, so I want to do that by highlighting the structure of the book, the way in which, uh, Becca, you contribute at different points, right? As to literally, in each chapter, make significant contributions to the book. And then I'm going to highlight uh, at least three areas where I feel are, uh, well, I have some questions uh, that I would love to uh, have you elaborate on, but also some questions that I think will be important for us uh, in the audience, right, to, to grapple with as we think about where the field of U.S. Latin American relations is and what we make of those encounters, right, between Latin Americans and the United States. So what you see here, it's uh, basically my way to kind of sketch out what the book does, right? So if you could picture yourself to a two parallel process, right? On the one hand, you have World War II and the good neighbor policy and the U.S. interest, right, the, to make things work and get Latin Americans to cooperate, mainly because of the urgency that World War II represents. So if that's on my right hand, that's one parallel process that Becca brings in from literally the early 20th century to the 1940s, right? But on the other hand, is the Latin American process, right? Which is embedded within this uh, calls for social reform, which is often expressed in uh, popular protests and, and, and pressure for social reform and this nationalist rhetoric, right? And those domestic politics, as well as the good neighbor policy, those are the two pillars that are shaping how U.S. diplomats, how Latin American political leaders behave, right? But most importantly, how people on the ground behave, right? And the, the contribution that you make is really engage the way in which people at the very high level, as well as on the ground, right? How they engage, they begin to use this language, right, that is embedded uh, within Latin America, but it's also very keenly aware that the U.S. government and different U.S. government agencies have an interest in getting the cooperation of Latin Americans. So stay with me for a minute because we have this parallel process, right, that we bring all the way up to the 1940s. And that is what you see at the high level. Um, if you look at the chart, the top chart there, right? And then in, if you look at the two middle um, uh, bubbles, so to speak, you have uh, the way in which uh, Becca really engages the reader on how labor tensions on the ground are mediated. And she does an amazing job looking at the way in which those conflicts often um, uh, are resolved just in a variety of ways, right? But if you look at uh, the way in which Latin Americans, especially Cuban workers, engage, they uh, you have the display of those nationalists, uh, that nationalist rhetoric, that display of labor reform, that pressure to to comply with uh, uh, labor policies that benefit the Cuban workers, right? She knows there's a disconnect between a progressive uh, Cuban labor law, for example, in, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, uh, 
in the U.S. labor policies that are applied at the basis, right? As workers navigate through that, they end up not only using just the Cuban judicial system, but even the U.S. judicial system as well, right? So it's an excellent contribution to the way we do transnational history, right? And she does an excellent job dissecting uh, the different layers of that transnational system, including those uh, judicial processes, right, across countries, which is, again, very, very impressive. Uh, but it's not just labor, progressive labor reform, or the pressure to adopt progressive labor reform that is um, uh, pushing for um, uh, addressing these uh, labor conditions at the military basis, right? The construction of military bases in Cuba and different parts of Latin America. It's also race, uh, or better yet, racism, um, that in the case of uh, Panama really is the driving force of labor tensions, right? She does an excellent job uh, looking at the uh, looking at the way, explaining the way in which uh, people on the ground in Cuba, in in, in Panama, uh, really begin to use U.S. racist attitudes, right, as kind of a leverage to push for reforms at various levels. So again, stay with me for a minute. We have, again, the uh, pressures in Latin America driven by calls for social reform, nationalism. We have the rhetoric of the good neighbor policy and the urgency of the Cold War as those two pillars. Then you have labor tensions driven by um, social conditions, by uh, um, um, labor legislation in Cuba. And in, in Brazil, for example, you have labor tensions driven by racial tensions or racial issues in Panama, right? So I would like you to kind of just stay with me here and go to the second, uh, the, the second two bubbles here, right? Um, because then um, what Deca does is she looks at the way in which in the context of those two pillars that I just mentioned, right? What are the tensions that surface on the ground? Uh, and she looks at the way in which prostitution and the behavior of U.S. servicemen in those military bases, right, serves as a source of conflict and how those conflicts are mediated. And it's a fascinating, fascinating story uh, that really gets at, uh, at those conflicts. Uh, on the other hand, right, uh, the, the, and I lost, uh, here's the, on this section here, right, she also looks at the way in which the, jurisdiction over the crimes committed by those servicemen on the ground, right? How that gets worked out within Latin American systems. And um, let me keep track of my time here. Um, and as uh, these conflicts unfold, one thing becomes clear, right? And that is that people on the ground resort to this notion that when it comes to the behavior or this quote unquote disrespectful behavior of your servicemen towards local culture, local traditions, that often gets used and appro gets appropriated and used by people on the ground, right? To push for um, uh, policies or uh, very specific demands that they have. Uh, same thing when it comes to uh, 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 issues over jurisdiction, over who should have uh, uh, questions of who should have jurisdiction over the crimes that US servicemen. Um, commit on the ground. Uh, uh, I, I do want to move on. Um, I'm, I'm keeping track of my time here. So I'm going to have to move on to the second part. Uh, the last bubble here is dealing with how um, after World War II, what are the limits to you, both U.S. and Latin Americans? What are the limits in terms of pushing their agendas, right? And she highlights that there are a, a number of limits on both ends. Um, but I want to move on um, to, I want to say critique, but so, some of the issues that I think I would love to hear more about, right? Or what I think is um, it's important for us to, uh, uh, to discuss, right? And one is that when we, as scholars, when we want to bring out that a the agency of local people on the ground, um, it does require an incredible amount of uh, pressure to balance what happens on the, uh, a number of factors, right? And it, at least in my judgment, I felt that the book strikes for that balance in most cases, reaches that balance. But in some cases, it leaves some questions uh, open, right? And I divided this in three different sections, right? The first one is the question dealing with the weight we give to different actors on the ground, right? Becca does an outstanding job 
looking at how people on the ground in Latin America exercise that agency as they negotiate with the United States. I would have loved to hear a bit more on the German side, right? We know that during World War II, uh, there's no doubt that Germany is scorting Latin Americans, right? And I think at different points, um, uh, those questions become pretty, pretty relevant. For example, uh, in the book, one of the, uh, one of the issues that, that raised that question for me at least is that this arms agreement uh, or sales that is happening between Brazil and Germany from 1938 to 1942, right? And at different points, uh, uh, you note in the book that the United States held back in signing an arms agreement with the United States. And it, it begged that question, right? If the urgency that the US feels on the ground, but the fear of German influence on the ground is so big, right? Uh, why would the US hold back in moving forward with an arms agreement with Brazil during this period, right? And I would love to hear more, uh, Becca, on, on that section. Um, so balancing the role that different actors play on the ground, I think that is, uh, that is important. And, and, and uh, to Becca's credit, this is an extremely, it's extremely, extremely challenging task for those of us doing US-Latin American relations, right? And looking at the nature of that encounter between people on the ground, people um, in high politics and how they negotiate with the United States. Uh, the second item that I think uh, when, um, when I comment uh, the need to strike for that balance is really that intersection, uh, that intersection between what happens in the social political sphere within that broader cultural context, right? And there is, you do an amazing job highlighting in, in the type of sources you use are just fascinating, very, very well researched. You make an extremely compelling argument at the diplomatic um, uh, side, right? The sociopolitical, and you make no secret, this is a sociopolitical history. Um, yet the, the question that surfaced as I was reading the, the, uh, this account is the following, right? What about those stories? What about if Latin Americans are using nationalism and this call for social reform to mobilize and pressure the US government as they, they, they are at the negotiating table. What about those Latin Americans who kind of buy into the US uh, a way of life, right? The American way of life and consumer culture. How much pressure do they provide, right? Or how much do politicians who are negotiating with the United States um, how much attention do they put to those sectors of Latin American society that buy into the American way of life? Uh, again, it's a question of balance and how much of that balance we bring into the narratives, right, that we build as we focus specifically, as we zero in on the sociopolitical sphere. In other words, what is the intersection of the sociopolitical sphere with the cultural sphere, right, as we write the history of those encounters. Um, and for me, I think at least this question is, uh, and I have to be honest, is partly driven by some of the very own research issues that surface for me, right? And let me just very quickly put this in perspective for you. So you have this picture, and I know this is a few years later, picture of Fidel Castro in 1959, the life fully sipping on Coca-Cola as he's pushing for this revolutionary movement, right? And you can, this nationalist chance in the background. Do I focus on sociopolitical sphere? If so, what do I make of Castro kind of buying into, again, the seductive nature, right, of um, the American way of life and consumer culture? So I do think for us, as scholars looking at U.S.-Latin American relations, that intersection, dissecting that intersection between the social and the political sphere and the broader cultural context, I think is important. Um, and I would love to uh, uh, I, again, to center part of the conversation on that. The, um, and last but not least, as I uh, wrap this up here, is the question of balance on how much agency we give to Latin Americans and U.S. diplomats, right, before or the period up to 1945 and the period after 1945. And, Becca, you do an excellent job at different parts of the book, living it open-ended. Uh, right, uh, which I think is critical, right? I, th I think it is important for those of us who, who are focused on looking at agency and the extent to which Latin Americans are attempting to shape conditions, it is important to keep it open-ended, uh, right? And, and you, you make no secret that uh, different points in the book to be a little bit open-ended. 
Uh, here are some of the conclusions, right? Um, or some of the questions that surface as we're going through the book were the following, right? If Latin Americans and US diplomats were so clever at playing the diplomatic game up to 1945, and if we have this urgency by 1947, uh, especially when some of the, the US uh, military bases are, are, are closed, um, if they're so clever at negotiating and making things work, even using national political leaders, right? As you go through the book, you'll see the Latin American political leaders, they use nationalist, popular protests and nationalism as a tool to get the US to, to gain more from the United States, right? So if they were so clever at negotiating, why did they lose uh, that uh, diplomatic mojo that they had before 1945, right? Uh, what changed? Um, and I think this is a, a fascinating question, and it really opening a new lines of new lines of research inquiries, right? As we look at the 1940s, um, and I, I, I do think it is important because when we come full circle, right? If we look at the nature of U.S. Latin American relations uh, from the late 1900s to the 1940s, the questions of Pan Americanism and the creation of uh, the OAS, um, I think there's a lot there that we could uncover. Um, but I, I did have some of those questions, um, and I'm going to stop there because I believe my time is up. Uh, but thank you for the invitation, and, and I look forward to the conversation. For so long, and you think all along the way, will anyone read this besides <laughs> so it's really neat nice to, to have you two come to this book fresh, not having read any of it before, and to really connect with it. And to... um, yeah. So I mean, I just what a moment! I'm so thrilled to have had you both read so carefully and to really connect with with the work. I'm I'm very grateful, um, and really grateful for all of those really provocative questions. Uh, I hope we can continue the conversation after because I I only want to take a couple of minutes so that folks have time to ask questions. But, um, gosh, so where to even begin? I mean, you both picked up on this question of the post, the transition to the post-war period. So maybe I'll just say something about that, uh, which is, Julio, to your question about, well, if they were so savvy, what changed or why didn't they carry that kind of clever use of, of these techniques into the post-war period? And, and a big thing is what changed was the context they were operating in. And so you do see these strategies persist into the post-war period. They're just not as effective because of a couple of things. One, the U.S. doesn't care as much about Latin America for a period of time as it did during the war. So the this belief that actively cultivating goodwill in the region is important to US, the United States best interests, that context goes away. And so a lot of the leverage goes away, but you still see folks using the same language of US security concerns to advance their requests and to try to say, no, you know, you should really invest in these development projects or you should really invest in this or that thing because it's it's going to be good for your interests. Um, it's just not as compelling when the United States is now focused on Europe and Asia and doesn't really, Latin America doesn't regain that super important place in US uh, strategic thinking until really the Cuban revolution. Um, and the other thing that changes the nature of the threat that defense strategists are obsessed with it's no longer uh, an extra hemispheric invasion, right? That would require this kind of infrastructural investment when the shift is really more about counterinsurgency and the fear of sort of communist infiltration. The nature of military aid changes, the nature of um, uh, that particular threat changes what US uh, resources are available. Um, so, I think one of the through lines that I see when I look at other periods when I'm thinking about this idea of cooperation with the United States is something worth taking seriously is it, people doing playing the best hand that they can with the cards they've been dealt and those cards change, right? So um, I think that's part of the story. This question about sovereignty, I think is so important. When I was thinking about where to focus my attentions, also thinking about the meaningful differences between how Cuba and Panama experienced this or people there did compared to Brazil, which didn't have that experience of US occupation and intervention. Um, uh, you're right that so Guantanamo, Puerto Rico, the Canal Zone are always a little bit present. And for US defense strategists, you know, the British colonies in the Caribbean, all these places are super important because 
the way that they can advance their interests there are different because of this question of sovereignty. So I tried to, I mean, Guantanamo is this kind of like shadow cast over the entire undertaking, right? So much of what has to happen is for people to show this isn't, this isn't just the proliferation of Guantanamo's across the region. Um, and so it's present in that way, but I wonder if I had said, okay, I'm going to take Roosevelt Rhodes as one of my case studies, if that could have been a really interesting opportunity for thinking even more about what sovereignty really means and what international hierarchy looks like in this period. And I think that's a, certainly something worth um, thinking about. Uh, you know, for there was a, a summer where a handful of folks working on U.S. basing in different parts of the world were um, being convened by Paul Kramer to have these like Zoom seminars where we would swap work. And it was really interesting because there were people who were working on U.S. basing in Okinawa and Japan and Germany and, you know, totally different contexts and seeing how these sets of challenges around governance manifested in different places was really rewarding. Um, but I think probably certainly would have pushed my own limits, uh, pushed me beyond the limits of my capabilities. Okay, I'll sit down and I'll invite questions. Thank you for those fantastic comments and the great response. Um, Do you have any um, questions in the room? And also on Zoom, if you have a question, um, on Zoom, if you have a question, oh. Oh, is it that thing? Yeah. yeah. People on Zoom, if you have a question, please feel free to submit it. Or is it this thing? Do you? <laughs> Do the Q and A. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for for this wonderful presentation of the book. I I haven't read it, so um, the question has to do with with the negotiations. Uh, by the political elite, so on the upper level, mm -hmm. but how did they use their negotiations with the U.S. Americans for their national politics? Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's kind of in between, right? The, the local level and the high. Yeah, political. yeah. This should be fun. Yeah, thank you. Um, how's that? Is that good? Um, uh, yeah, so I think the the chapter title is like high politics and horse trading, and there is a lot of really quid pro quo, um, not as cynical as that sounds, like legitimately, for example, the Brazilian government saying, well, if you really want us to be equal partners in defense, we need modern weapons and um, uh, modernization of security forces is a really important nation building objective at this moment. Um, and so this question about, um, you know, there's some really great scholarship. Brazil is one area in, uh, in Latin America that has had a, a really uh, sizable amount of written on this period, in part because Getulio Vargas did this really amazing job of playing the global context to his advantage. So um, he negotiated arms deals with Germany that really alarmed folks in the U.S., so then the U.S. government stepped forward and said, no, 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 we'll, you know, let's, maybe we can help you get the things that you need. But part of the problem wasn't the will, it was the practical ability to do it, figuring out how to do it legally, how to, where the weapons would come from. Eventually the Lend-Lease Act enables a lot more movement of those kinds of materials. But um, at one point, I think the best they could do was like prevent German shipments from being <laughs> stopped, right? Um, so, okay, so military aid was one of the examples. Um, then the um, investment in various parts of industry. So Volta Redonda, which was this really important economic uh, sort of symbol of economic nationalism in Brazil, a steel mill uh, was uh, built with financing from the US. Uh, investment in the revitalization of the rubber industry in Brazil, because this is valuable to the United States strategic interests, right? The need for rubber during World War II. Um, and then there were all kinds of ways that were coming from the United States, but then could be kind of channeled towards uh, areas of interest. So for example, um, the US invested in public health infrastructure and thought of this as advantageous on a couple of levels. One was to protect the health of US servicemen. Another was to protect the health of rubber workers, right? So that they didn't get sick and stop being productive. 
And then another was on this goodwill level, right? If the United States is contributing to uh, uh, sort of aid Brazil in the in the development of um, uh, public health capabilities, then that was a positive thing. So, I mean, I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and we're still trying to brainwash them to the idea that cooperation is just a family value and a social good. But I think cooperation is really a, an effective way to get what you want, right? And so you see that on both sides of these negotiations, trying to find places where security interests dovetail with nation building objectives. And if I may, I mean, the evidence you provide, right? For that uh, quid pro quo, it, it's just very impressive, right? I mean, you definitely dive into uh, provided that I have evidence um, for those type of, you know, that type of interaction. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, and in the Brazilian case, like I really relied on the work of Frank McCann. I mean, there are some great folks who are really interested in military history who have done uh, a lot of the heavy lifting there. But then in some cases, um, you know, it was really digging into those diplomatic archives and uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Becca, thank you. Is this on? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your chapter on uh, prostitution regulation and policy. Um, because when I think about, when I teach on U.S. imperial policy in Puerto Rico, and I'm thinking about Laura Briggs's work and mm -hmm. the kind of adaptation of British, um, uh, I guess, prostitu prostitution regulation policies, and then how that changes in 1917, I'm wondering how your chapter might help me kind of speak to that and also reframe it and kind of bring it towards World War II? Like, how would you connect those histories for an undergraduate audience? Mm. Um, thanks. That's a great question, Bernadette. Um, I think, so that chapter sort of became a broad umbrella sex chapter where the second half is really devoted to prostitution. And then the first half is looking more at uh, gender relations and changing social customs and the establishment of USO clubs, which were new and um, kind of conflicts that those uh, created, particularly in Brazil, where um, uh, US officials were eager to encourage US servicemen to have sort of wholesome recreation options where they could engage with women from elite families who were perceived to be less likely to carry a disease and keep them away from red light districts. And that created all kinds of tensions. Um, the section on prostitution um, thinks about, well, this overwhelming concern about military readiness and venereal disease uh, led to, on the one hand, creation of wholesome recreation options. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, efforts to sanitize prostitution. And the way that this kind of connects back to this threat of sovereignty is that, um, it, you know, this is a period where Latin American nations, well, nations around the world are still trying to think like, what is the most effective, most modern way to, to deal with sex work, right? So do you try to have a, a policy of uh, suppression and abolition? Do you criminalize it? Do you um, not prohibit it, but decriminalize it? And so all of those questions are kind of ongoing in each of the places that I'm looking at. Um, and uh, the War Department's official policy is suppression, keep US soldiers away from prostitutes. But ultimately at each place, there's these like really um, uh, kind of tailored to the local context based on what the red light districts look like, policies for managing sex work and US soldiers access to sex workers. And so I think um, it intersects a little bit with that earlier scholarship in that it's uh, not an imperial context, but it is grappling with how US officials do or don't respond to the reality of local jurisdictions. Um, I don't know, I'd be curious to talk to you about this after. Maybe I can send, I can send you the chapter and, and just that section we can think about how they connect, yeah. That's a good question. I think about, and it kind of goes back to this question of when you're the sovereign versus non-sovereign space, and how the story looks different. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think there's there's more on this, the in, sort of environmental history of U.S. military bases during the Cold War period, and it's possible that my next book will have a chapter that thinks about this. And in fact, well, we'll talk after. But Vegas is one of the places that would be an obvious place to to think through these problems. But um, uh. In terms of the environmental consequences of this moment, I didn't dedicate any space in the book to it, 
there's some about in terms of the afterlives of the bases of what happens to these airfields. Most of them become national airports or national military bases. One of them was one of the airfields that the aerial support for the Bay of Pigs invasion was supposed to bomb. It was supposed to be one of their uh, aerial targets. Um, but uh, I guess the short answer is not with this project, maybe with a future project. John Lindsay Poland has a book about it in Panama specifically. Um, also when it comes to testing you know, weapons and the environmental fallout of that. But just in terms of paving the airfields, I didn't see a lot of discussion of, of the environmental harm that that would cause. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you, Rebecca, for writing this fantastic book. Thank you, Julio and Jose Juan, for those wonderful comments. And all of you for being present and engaging. Thank you, thank you.